five seconds to submergence, submergence deep into the absurd. One night, in long bygone times, man awoke and saw himself. He saw that he was naked under cosmos, homeless in his own body. All things dissolved before his testing thought, wonder above wonder, horror above horror, unfolded in his mind. Then woman too awoke and said it was time to go and slay. And he fetched his bow and arrow, a fruit of the marriage of spirit and hand, went outside beneath the stars. But as the breast arrived at their water holes, where he expected them of habit, he felt no more the tigers bound in his blood, but a great solemn about the brotherhood of suffering between everything alive. That day he did not return with prey. When they found him by the next new moon, he was sitting dead by the water hole. There's an excerpt from Peter Zapp's The Last Messiah. I bring this up today because I'll be talking about morality and how morality has evolved over time from tribes to when we first had agriculture to the modern day, or I guess uh, the modern era from the 1700s up until now. And of course, I guess it is a little bit different today, um, much different than it was, I suppose. So, but I bring up Zapf, and I bring up this uh, excerpt from The Last Messiah, because it reveals the absurdity, the existentialism in our minds, and that's kind of where morality kind of begins, right? It's, uh, it's, it's this thing that's kind of echoed in so many other stories, and Later on, after The Last Messiah, we have, or after Zapf, we have Albert Camus, who says in The Myth of Sisyphus that there is but one truly serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. The question as to whether or not life is or is not worth living. So, this man, or I guess man, from Zapf's little story here, he kills himself. Why does he kill himself? He decides that life is not worth living. And why is life not worth living? Because there's way too much suffering. He doesn't... He's caught in a dilemma. If he doesn't kill the animal, he starves and dies. If he kills the animal, he causes the animal suffering. So either him and his family suffer... Or the animals suffer. And then he starts to realize, after this realization, he sees, oh, everything suffers, right? Everything dies. Everything is going to suffer. <clears throat> Fuck this shit. I'm out. So then he kills himself. Now, this is kind of a, this is a story that's been echoed everywhere. It's, um, and I do want to bring up, actually, this quote from Nietzsche. It's in Beyond Good and Evil, uh, the Epigrams and Interludes chapter, number 152. Quote, where the tree of knowledge stands, there is always paradise. Thus speak the oldest and the youngest serpents. So, serpents, well, what Nietzsche is saying here is that serpents will lead you to the tree of knowledge, because serpents will say that you will have paradise where there is knowledge. If you have knowledge, things will be better, right? And of course, if the serpent has that knowledge, <laughs> then the serpent can control you, right? Now, that's, of course, one uh, theory for the origin of morality, the origin of... Uh, rule-based morality, because what is morality, right? Morality is the symbolization of empathy and sympathy. And when you symbolize these things, you can then stretch the truth a little bit, right? And if you make rules on emotions, 
rules based on emotions, then these rules certainly won't apply to everyone, or at least they can't really be generalized to a whole group of people without causing some dismay. Now, I, I bring this up, right, the, the serpent, the knowledge, because what, what's happening here is something that's been echoed in so many stories, uh, most notably Genesis, which I brought up in, I'm pretty sure, the past two podcasts. But essentially, the, you know, Adam and Eve eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then they're uh, doomed to cultivate the earth for all of eternity. Now, they're convinced by a serpent to eat from the tree, convinced by a serpent to have knowledge. The serpent is evil. The serpent represents Satan. And in a sense, this story is kind of an old wise tale of uh, don't let people basically manipulate you. Uh, there's so many other meanings, but in the context of morality, I think what this story is saying is don't let people manipulate you by t by telling you that they have the truth or that they know what is good, what is evil, right? Now, <clears throat> I want to read the following two paragraphs that come after Zap's excerpt or the excerpt that I took from Zap. Quote, whatever happened, a breach in the very unity of life, a biological paradox, an abomination, an absurdity, an exaggeration of disastrous nature, Life had overshot its target, blowing itself apart. A species had been armed too heavily by a spirit made almighty without, but equally a menace to its own well-being. Its weapon was like a sword without hilt or plate, a two-edged blade cleaving everything. But he who is to wield it must grasp the blade and turn the one edge towards himself. <clears throat> Despite his new eyes, man was still rooted in matter. His soul spun into it and subordinated to its blind laws. And yet, he could see matter as a stranger, compare himself to all phenomena, see through and locate his vital processes. I'm going to stop there. Because, and yet he could see matter as a stranger, right? Matter is something different than himself. Because uh, if we recall the very beginning of this essay, he says, One night in long bygone times, man awoke and saw himself. That means that man could differentiate himself from everything else. And if uh, th this brings to mind Ishmael. And in Ishmael, there's this gorilla, this talking gorilla who talks to this guy and tells him all these revelations. And what the gorilla says is that before he was captured and brought into the zoo, um, he pictured himself and all the other gorillas as a hand. Just one hand. And uh, each, each finger represented a gorilla. But of course that didn't matter because they were all one hand. But once the gorilla named Ishmael was named Ishmael, given a designation, given a individuality, it felt as if Ishmael was not a hand, or not part of a hand, but rather a severed finger. A severed finger. He was disconnected from everything else once he was named. In a sense, humankind is the loneliest animal, because we're all named. And we all feel separated from everything else. Even a tiger or a cougar feels less lonely than we do. But, of course, that's a tangent. But I wanted to say that because it's, it's important. Because once we see our own individuality, we see everything else as different. Everything else is different than us. We're not a part of the world. We're different than the world. And as we recall from Nietzsche, the good man sees the whole world as evil. Because the good man differentiates himself from the rest of the world. The good man sees himself as good, therefore the rest of the world is evil. Right? And if we separate ourselves from the world, we will see the world 
as something different than us. And in a sense, the thing that's different than us, it competes with us. So we see it as evil. And uh, all I have to say to that is read To Lies to Death by Chris Ryan. Or read Ishmael. But anyways, I'll continue with this, uh, the rest of this. Let's see. Uh, it's been about processes. He comes to nature as an unbidden guest in vain, extending his arms to beg consolation with its maker. Nature answers no more. It performed a miracle with man, but later did not know him. He has lost his right of residence in the universe, has eaten from the tree of knowledge, and been expelled from paradise. He is mighty in the new, near world, but curses his might as purchased with his harmony of soul, his innocence, his inner peace in life's embrace. So he has eaten from the tree of knowledge. He's lost his residence in the universe. So he says lost his residence in the universe, and then he says that he's eaten from the tree of knowledge. He's been expelled from paradise. So I think all this implies that the universe was paradise, but then man had knowledge, right? And so he's expelled from paradise. Man now sees everything as suffering. He sees death, he understands it, and now he's out of this blissful ignorance because he's conscious of death, he's conscious of all the suffering, and this brings him great terror. And with that terror... Um, just because we're reading from Zaf, I'm going to explain what he then does. He says that because of terror, because of this fear of death, um, humankind resorts to um, four things, or at least uh, four major things, at the very least. He resorts to isolation, anchoring, distraction, and sublimation to conquer his fear of death. And then Zaf goes on and explains these where isolation is essentially uh, separating yourself from death. Uh, you know, like, I don't want to think about it, right? In our society, we do this by, uh, we put people in coffins so we can't see them, and then we bury them under the ground. Uh, we also, you know, people, I, I don't really, I've never even seen a dead body, and I don't know many people who have. Uh we are very separated from death. We don't even see the animals that we eat get killed. We don't see their dead bodies either. We just see their meat in the grocery store. Of course, if you're hunting, you see this. But we are very isolated from death. Then there is anchoring. So we anchor our meaning onto certain things. Like politics. Most notably, religion. Um, and school, uh, traditions, things like that. We anchor our lives upon certain things in order to grasp a little bit of meaning. Then there's distraction. We distract ourselves from death. We distract ourselves from existential dread. We do this by playing video games, watching TV, having sex, drinking alcohol, which I'm actually drinking um, I'm not sponsored, but I'm drinking two shots of Fireball in Diet Dr. Pepper, and it's delicious. And that is a distraction. Smoking weed is a distraction. All sorts of things are distractions. Sports are distractions. Sports are kind of an anchoring, but a lot of these things uh, mix and match with each other. Also, with isolation, uh, we use euphemisms. That's also another form of isolation. And doctors kind of isolate themselves. Uh, they kind of repress feelings. Any form of repression is isolation as well. Uh, and then the fourth one is sublimation. So we turn death into beauty. And that's what Zaff is doing here. He's writing an essay about existentialism. And it's a very beautiful essay. And that's sublimation. You're turning this horrible thing into something beautiful. So we do this in our society because we're afraid of death, right? And a, a lot of this kind of goes into, well, is life worth living? And then uh, we, we want to find meaning in the world. 
right? And for most people, the most meaningful thing to us is the other people in our lives. And because the other people in our lives are some of the most meaningful thing, I think that's why we have morality. Because we value the people in our lives, so we have to come up with these rules to make sure that we don't uh, piss them off and we make sure that other people don't piss them off, right? And how did morality begin? Well, first and foremost, we started in tribes, right? Hunters and gatherers. We didn't have necessarily any formal rules, any written rules, but there were some unspoken rules. And we could see, oh, this guy did that. And so he got exiled from the tribe. Or this guy did that and he got killed, right? Um, that there's certain things we could just see certain behavior and we talk about it and perhaps we discuss it and that person would get killed, right? But then, since tribes are so small, this was very easy to pan out these rules. You didn't have to like put down a rule list. Like people would kind of just know it based off intuition and they'd also have their empathy and sympathy inside their brain. But... As the population increased, uh, partially due to agriculture, but of course, uh, if you read Chris Ryan's Civilized to Death, you'll learn about a lot of research that's coming out that suggests that agriculture actually came out as a necessity. It's a necessity because it, when they study the sediment or whatever in the Earth's, Earth's crust, they can see that every time that there's been agriculture on the planet where it started, you can look back and see that there was times of very plentiful resources on the planet for hunters and gatherers. And what does this mean? If there is plentiful resources, that means that they were able to get a lot of food and they were able to reproduce more, so they made more babies. And since they had so many people, well, once there was scarcity again, they had all these people, so what were they going to do? And the answer was agriculture. So anyways, once populations increased within a settlement, once we started having settlements, uh, once we had civilization, we had to create uh, rules, right? And I believe his name is Murabi. Uh, created one of the first laws and essentially laws are our first basis for morality because morality is just basically a list of rules in a sense and sort of ethics but we had laws and Moravi said an eye for an eye right uh, you kill someone you get killed you steal from someone we take all your property Things like that. And of course, in my last podcast, I uh, gave the quote that an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Um, so not necessarily the best philosophy, but it at least was a good starter point. And after Murabi, we have the Old Testament. Uh, we have the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments sort of lay out a bunch of rules. And of course, these rules are a lot easier to follow than Murabi's because Murabi's came from Murabi. But the Old Testament rules supposedly came from God, at least according to Moses when he spoke to the burning bush alone in a cave that no one witnessed but Moses. But Anyways, of course, I, I don't find these stories literal. They're just uh, stories. But, of course, the exodus of Moses actually did happen. I'm, at least I'm pretty sure it actually did happen. Not sure if his name was Moses. But, anyhow, we have the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments basically give out ten rules. I'm not going to list them off. But they're basically for people to follow. 
for morality, and of course, uh, obviously the Old Testament and the Jewish tradition isn't the only bringer of more moral ideas uh, in the form of rules. And I'm actually pretty sure that Zarath or Zoroastrianism or whatever it's called is actually one of the first one of the first uh, religions who have a moral system that we know of, at least in the monotheistic tradition. And I could be totally wrong there, but anyways, religion, uh, at least religion within civilizations, this brings about. Morality in the form of a rule list that is supposedly, quote-unquote, ordained from God. So, we went from tribes, and then we went to, we went to tribes where there was unspoken agreements, uh, social contract, as Thomas Hobbes would say. And then we went to uh, big cities and civilizations, and we had laws, as well as... Um, religious morality right and these are sort of the basis for what morality is because what morality in a sense is the code of conduct between human beings morality is the social contract and this social contract is sometimes written such as in the old testament or in Moravi's laws or this code of conduct is unspoken such as in tribes And later on, you know, we have a, a bunch of thinkers. We have people like the Greeks talking about morality. Uh, I, I'm not going to get into that today. And then we have way later on during the Enlightenment era, we have people kind of moving away from God-given morality. And having logical-based morality. But in actuality, it's not even that logical. But, of course, that's what they would call it. Human-based morality. Human-given morality. And, at least in Western thought, I'm going to give two examples. That is John Stuart Mill and Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant had the categorical imperative of course, if you've taken any Philosophy 101 or Ethics 101 course, you've heard of the Categorical Imperative and you've heard of uh, Mill's Utilitarianism. But I'm going to explain them, pros and cons, perhaps. What is the Categorical Imperative? The Categorical Imperative is essentially... Um, it's, it's asking... Well, what would it look like if everyone did that action, right? Let's say smoking. What would the world look like if everyone smoked? What would happen? Well, if everyone smoked, it'd be disgusting, right? So maybe everyone shouldn't smoke, right? So if if everyone does it, and that world kind of looks shitty, then you probably shouldn't do it, right? So this is implying that you look at life like, okay, should I walk or should I jaywalk right now? And then the, the categorical imperative asks you, well, if everyone jaywalked, then it would be horrible because everyone, a bunch of people get hit by a car, right? It'd be terrible. So uh, yeah, we gotta make that illegal, right? You're or, or you can't jaywalk. Sorry. So, I think this sort of implies that, in a sense, well, for one, the biggest lapse in this is that everyone's not going to do the thing that you're gonna do. That's just impossible. Everyone's not gonna go and jaywalk, right? Everyone's not gonna jaywalk at the same time either. Uh, it also implies that everyone is the same, right? That everyone will be affected the same by certain things. You know, if everyone smoked, you know, people probably won't be affected the same. You know, not everyone will be affected the same, right? 
Um, and also it's like, well, should I give birth? Well, what if everyone gave birth? Yeah, everyone can't give birth. So it's a dumb argument. Um, I, I'm not really into Mills, or sorry, into Kant's categorical imperative. But he also speaks a lot about duty. And this is something that's prevalent in Western philosophy as well as Eastern philosophy. And I believe I talked with someone, well, one of the guests on the podcast, I don't remember who it was, but we were talking about how Confucianism is basically East, the, uh, or sorry, Kant's philosophy is essentially the Western version of Confucianism, where Confucianism talks a lot about social duty. All right, we're back. The roommate came home. Dog started barking. Yada, yada, yada. Anyways. Back at it. We left off with Kant, the categorical imperative. And we also have... We're going to move on to Mill. Uh, John Stuart Mill. John Stuart Mill was a formulator of utilitarianism. What is utilitarianism? Well... First and foremost, uh, we have the root of utilitarianism, that's utility. Utilitarianism is all about what you should do what's useful. Um, and what's useful? Well, how, how do you decide what's useful? Well, what's useful is what brings the most amount of good to creates the greatest possible amount of good for the greatest number of people. That's utilitarianism. The problem with utilitarianism is that it's very subjective. You say, well, this or that will create the greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people. But that's you saying that. Um, and someone might disagree with that. And plus, how do you know that will even create the greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people? How do you know what the action that you're about to commit will create the greatest amount of good, at least the good in your eyes, for the greatest number of people? So there's two assumptions here. One, you know that what you're about to do will create the greatest number of good for the greatest number of people which obviously that's impossible to know. And two, that the thing that you're doing or the good that you're describing is good. And of course, if you're describing something to be good, uh, you're the one who believes it to be good. And we all believe what is good is different. Or at least we believe differently about what is or what is not good. Obviously, a lot of things people agree on, but... You know, goodness is very subjective. So that's where utilitarianism sort of falls apart. But of course, uh, I can sympathize with these philosophers because in college I wrote a manifesto about my idea of what the perfect society would be. And, you know, I started writing all these rules and stuff and and anyhow, when you get in your head where you're thinking, oh, yeah, like, I know the answer. I know what the, I know what the absolute morality is. I know what it is. You start writing all these formulations, and then you have to try to justify everything because you believe that you're right. And you create this big old hump of complete bullshit, basically. And this happens to a lot of philosophers. This happens to a lot of thinkers where they have this idea and they believe that they're right. So they have to try to keep justifying it. And eventually everything falls apart because they don't point out their own contradictions because they want to ignore those things. Right. And that's sort of what morality is all about. Uh, there's people who say that something's good. And then uh, that sort of all falls apart. Uh, there's another quote from Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil. I read it earlier. Let me just find it. One no longer loves one's insight enough once one communicates it. So, 
The thing is, once we say something out loud, that's when we kind of start to see the flaws in it, right? But a lot of times, philosophers, they'll write something down and they don't want to see the flaws in it. So they'll keep continuing on with it. They'll keep basically making up things that don't make sense. And they'll have all these thoughts that basically in the end don't make any sense and they're worthless. Well, I mean, they have some worth. Worthless is a little harsh, but anyhow. Uh, when you communicate something, you'll see the amount of illogic in it. Because when you're thinking about something, conceptualizing it, uh, it makes a lot more sense because you're understanding it on a very deep level that doesn't necessarily involve words. Sure, you're using words to conceptualize it, but the way you conceptualize something in your brain is sort of beyond words. But once you write it down or once you word it out out loud, that's when it becomes jumbled. Especially when uh, in the moment of having the inquiry, you have this huge epiphany. Uh, you'll have the epiphany, you'll be thinking, you'll be thinking, you'll be thinking. And then when you go to write it down or you go to talk to someone about it, you can't really say it in such a way that they'll understand the epiphany that you had. And honestly, you, you might not even be able to explain it back to yourself and remember what you had the epiphany about. Uh, when, whenever you communicate something, it becomes kind of lost in the words. And that's, of course, that's a problem with language. And, uh, of course, Nietzsche on language, he'll, he talks about all these things, such as uh, how language is basically creating, making things equal that aren't equal. Like uh, you call leaf a leaf, but all leaves are different, right? So anyhow, once you communicate something, it becomes basically incommunicable. Um, that kind of goes back to Fear and Trembling by Kierkegaard, where Kierkegaard discusses how Abraham's justification of killing Isaac is incommunicable. So he doesn't tell Isaac why he's about to go sacrifice him. Not 100% sure if he tells him that he is sacrificing him, but of course if he does tell him that he's sacrificing him, he won't be able to tell him why, because the reason why will be incommunicable, because, well, he's doing because God told him so, but Isaac will be like, God told you so, but, but, what? You're fucking crazy, bro. <laughs> like, right? That, that's what Isaac would say to Abraham. It, it's incommunicable, right? Because Abraham had this epiphany, and he believed that epiphany came from God. And so he wouldn't be able to communicate to that, that to Isaac uh, without Isaac misunderstanding him. Right. So anyhow, uh, that's kind of how this whole morality thing is. You know, you have the Ten Commandments, you have all these rules, you have the United States government having all these rules there in writing. But you will, no matter what, see flaws in them. Right. For instance, thou shalt not kill. Well, what if they're trying to kill me, right? And I kill them in self-defense, right? Well, then I guess that's okay. Right? If you kill in self-defense, it's different. But they're still killing, right? So that's kind of where these things, all these things break down. Because you can't really define morality on a, with words. You can't define, morality is... You have to base morality on a one-to-one uh, -one or an occurrence-by-occurrence -occurrence scale, right? Uh, because every single occurrence is different than every other occurrence. And you can't really say that, you can't really base your moral judgment on a list of rules because every situation is different. You know, if someone's trying to kill you, so you kill them. Or what if you're starving in the and there's this guy has some food right over there, but say you're unable to ask him for some reason if you can have the food. Or maybe you do ask him for the food and he says no. But you really need the food, right? So what are you gonna do? 
Are you going to go try find food somewhere else? Or are you just going to take this food that's literally right in front of you? Chances are, if you're starving and you're desperate, you might just take that food and eat it. Is that immoral? Well, you just stole food from someone. But, I mean, it's uh, questionable whether or not that is immoral, right? Based on that situation. You're starving, so you stole some food, right? All right if you're starving, you don't have any money. You see a grocery store and you steal some food from the grocery store. I mean, you were starving, right? And you didn't have any money. So where are you going to get food from? Uh, you're just stealing from a corporation, basically. So is that even bad? The, this is where all these uh, morality kind of breaks down because we want to believe that there's rules for morality. We want to believe that there's, you know, this is good, this is evil because it makes it easy for us to go about our lives, you know, like, well, I can't kill, right? I can't steal, can't do any things. If you have all these rules, it's easier to go about your life because you know that you won't be harming anyone. Or in the case of the religious, you know that you might go to heaven, right? Uh, morality is based off of a reward and punishment system. Okay, if I'm bad, I'll go to hell. If I'm good, I'll go to heaven. All right, it's based off of sin. If you commit sin, you'll go to hell. If you don't commit sin, you'll go to heaven. And of course, uh, the the um, philosophy of heaven and hell are kind of conflated. I haven't read the Old Testament, but I know that in Judaism, there isn't necessarily a heaven or hell. It's sort of different. There's kind of just one afterlife. But um, uh, of course, in Christianity, there is, I know for sure that there's a hell in Christianity, and you go to hell if, say, you don't repent your sins, because if you do repent your sins, you can be forgiven, you go to heaven, right? So that's sort of, that's also a different aspect of morality, and in a sense, it's a very good aspect of morality, because it kind of breaks down morality well like what is moral right um like if you sin you can be forgiven and in a sense that's a very good thing right because that that way if you have unconditional forgiveness um if you know that someone will forgive you you're you're not gonna actually go and you're not gonna want to go oh I'll, I'll kill this person like i'll be forgiven right because you'll feel bad that you'll be Right, you'll be forgot. You'll feel bad that you're getting forgiven for killing someone. So it's actually a pretty good um, uh, mo moral basis in a sense. But it, no, but um, anyhow, a lot of people base their morality on going to heaven or hell. If you do bad things, you go to hell. If you do good things, you go to heaven. Right. Uh, and, and this is just a thing that's, I mean, this is an obvious, this is just basic conditioning, right? Uh, when you train a dog to sit or come to you or to stay, you use food, you give them a reward if they follow your command, uh, you punish them if they don't. And that's where we kind of see the the hidden uh, man, I'm looking at my dog right or my girlfriend's dog right now and she's kind of twitching a little bit in her sleep it's so weird I think I think she's just dreaming okay she's fine he was just dreaming. Right. Um, anyhow, we can kind of see like what morality is all about in a civilization. Morality is about controlling people, right? We can see this clearly when we train dogs. They get a reward when they do something that we like. They get punished if we do something that we don't like. That's what morality is. At least on a global civilizational scale. And what Nietzsche said about the serpent, um, the serpent says that the tree of knowledge is wherever paradise is, right? Or paradise is wherever the tree of knowledge is. Because the serpent rewards you if you do what the serpent thinks 
is good because the serpent holds the serpent has all the answers the serpent knows what is or what is not good because there's all these people out there who will tell you what is or what is not good and they'll try to convince you of that and then they use that to control you we see this most in politics uh, especially in our bipartisan system where I, I believe I discussed this on the last podcast where e- essentially a political leader they will say this or that is good or evil right or they'll say that they're the opposing political party is evil, right? Of course, no, I mean, they don't say that, but everyone who follows this politician believes that the other side is evil, right? And since they have that belief that the other side is evil, this politician can then say, well, I'm going to implement this into the political system. And this thing that I'm implementing in the political system will oppose what the other side is trying to implement. And since it opposes what the other side is implementing, and since people believe the other side is evil, then that means that what this politician is doing is good, right? So it's very easy to manipulate people into believing that what a politician is doing is good if they oppose the other political party. Because if you split these things into good and evil, then people will automatically follow everything on one side and oppose everything on the other. And that's how everyone is so divided in the United States. Um, but this whole morality thing, it, it, it kind of has evolved in, into that. It hasn't even evolved in that. It's just It's been like that ever since we could divide people, ever since we had these big civilizations, we had all these uh, talking heads that said all these things and manipulated people into believing certain thoughts and basically turned everyone against each other. So, of course, divide and conquer is the way it's powerful. But there's other questions about morality. Now, there's a tribe in South America. They believe that when someone dies in the tribe, that if they eat their dead body, or the meat from their dead body, their soul will then remain in the tribe. If they don't eat the dead body, then their soul will basically dissipate into the wind and be gone forever. So, when someone dies, they eat their dead body. And they believe that this is good because it keeps their soul within the tribe. And everyone knows, everyone's fully aware that when they die, they're going to be eaten by their tribe. They're going to be coming into... They're going to remain in the tribe as a soul amongst them. So they all say, oh yeah, that's totally good. That's like the way things are. Sweet. When I die, I'm going to get eaten and my soul is going to go into the tribe and I'll still be with them for the rest of eternity. So I was telling my friend about this. And he was saying that he was like, he was totally blown away. He was like, that is so evil. That's horrible. Like, I know in my heart that it is evil to eat my mother's dead body. And he, and yeah, I mean, like, I would never do that. Like, I also think it's evil, right? It's, that's disgusting too. Like, I would never do that, right? No one in our society would do that unless they're, could totally lost their mind but the thing is that's because we don't have the belief that when you eat someone their soul s- stays within you and your tribe right if we had that belief we might think differently but since we don't have that belief it's totally disgusting and you can't even wrap your mind around doing something like that because it sounds horrific it sounds like something a psychopath would do 
But if everyone believes that it's a good thing, literally everyone believes it's a good thing, that means that you also believe that it'll be a good thing if people do that to you when you die. So it's less, it's become something that's not evil, but something that's actually kind of beautiful. Um, and, and that's kind of where morality is, that's where like you can see how morality is so different amongst cultures because it totally, it's totally uh, reliant upon the beliefs of a group of people and their metaphysical beliefs, their physical beliefs, everything that they believe about uh, reality, the soul, the nature of the human spirit, things like that. Morality is totally dependent on all those things. It all comes into play. It's a variable that affects everything, right? Um, and there, there's another quote from Nietzsche in Beyond Good and Evil. It says, What a time experiences evil is usually an untimely echo, what was formerly experiences good. The atavism of a more ancient ideal. That's sort of just saying how ethics and morality changes over time. What is seen as good and what is seen as evil, it evolves continuously over time. And you you can't really grasp that. You can't really take a hold of it because it changes so gradually that eventually everyone kind of starts to believe it, right? Because you, you can see today that, uh, for instance, um, people used to think that gay marriage was totally evil and horrible thing. But I'm seeing people that used to think there was evil like 10 years ago be totally okay with it today. So it's, it's sort of this thing where you can actually see morality evolve over time, even today where people will totally change their opinion on something. They'll be like, oh, yeah, that, that's totally fine, right? And, of course, uh, you can reread what Nietzsche says as uh, what a time experiences is good is usually an untimely echo of what was formerly experienced as evil, right? So things that were good turn into something that's evil. Things that were evil turn into something that's good, right? of course, you can take all of what Nietzsche says with a grain of salt, because obviously this isn't always the case. But everything changes over time, and everyone's morality and everyone's view on the world is generally different. So that's why it's hard to say that... That's why, obviously, morality can't be sort of this one-sided street where this is right, this is wrong, morality is gray. The lines are blurred because morality is based off of what people think is good and evil, right? Uh, there's, of course, the useful definition, the utility, that's from Mill. But th there's also something like what, what brings the most amount of happiness, right? W will this make someone happy? Will this or that make someone happy? That's also another morality. Uh, but in the case of the, it, will what you do cause someone harm? Right, that that's a very basic one. Right, in the uh, in the case of the person getting eaten after they die, that's not really causing anyone harm if anyone if everyone believes that it's a good thing and everyone's okay with it. Right, it's a totally consensual thing. But in our society, if someone did that, it would cause a lot of people harm, right? Because everyone would be like, oh my God, that's so disturbing, right? And it would totally disturb them and it'd be very harmful. So that's why it's bad in our society, right? Um, and I'm obviously using this example because it's a very extreme. It's a very extreme example of when this occurs. But there, there's another example. Um, I was at Albertsons the other day and... It was buy two, get two free of these 12 packs of Dr. Pepper Zero Sugar. So, you know, I bought four packs and I also bought a big case of waters. And I was walking outside and this lady comes up to me and she asks, Hey, do you have a couple bucks for so I can get something to drink? Of course, she looked kind of sad when she said it. She was a little overweight. So it was like, eh, like, are you 
Like, you're probably not homeless if you're a little overweight. <laughs> like, because you probably haven't been starving. Um, like, oh yeah, I know that's like a generalization, but um, anyhow, I was like, okay, like, this lady seems like he needs something to drink, he needs some water because he's struggling right now. Okay. So I, you know, and I had some cash, so I started looking through my cash. And then I realized, oh, I have all these drinks, right? So I gave her a whole case of Dr. Pepper. And I gave her like four water bottles. And I started walking to my car. And then this group of people in SUV rolled down their window. I'm like, man, you're such a good person. I'm like, okay, well, thank you. And I kept walking to my car. And I was thinking to myself, like, but am I though? How does giving someone something to drink constitute me being a good person? For one, they're basing me being a good person off of one single action, right? Oh, this guy is giving some Dr. Pepper to people. Uh, he's a good person, right? They don't know about any of the bad things I've done. They don't know about any of the other things that I've done in my entire life, right? They don't know about any of that. Yet they're basing their judgment off of me being a good person, off of me giving uh, some drinks to some lady of course there's the assumption that if i do this once then i've probably done it before that uh, so yeah they're like oh the type of person that gives things away to someone you know, that's a good person right this is kind of where i want to go back to util utilitarianism the thing about utilitarianism is that the ends always justify the means um that because you're trying to create the most amount of happiness for the most amount of people, for the most amount of good for the most amount of people. So you can do anything evil to create horrible means, right? But the thing is, that's not always, I don't believe that the ends always justify the means. And likewise, I don't think the means always justify the ends, And while giving Dr. Pepper and some water to this lady is a good action, at least it seems like a good action because I'm making this person happy, um, regardless of whether they're scamming me and they actually have money, I'm making this person happy. And I guess that's, uh, that's a good thing, right? But what are the ends, right? What if people keep giving her water or if they keep giving her money? And she never learns to get these things on her own. That, in a sense, is a net negative. That's actually, you're actually hurting her by giving her stuff. Rather than helping her. So, was my action actually even a good thing? That's a question there. Do the means justify the ends? And, or do the ends justify the means? That's, you, I, I like to ask myself these things, dude. Does the end justify the means? Do the means justify the ends? And a, a lot of times, the big picture is kind of more important because you want to think of things in the long term because we live on Earth for a longer time. But of course, you want to do good things in the moment, right? You're not really thinking about the future when you do something good for someone, at least most of the time. So it's kind of a conflicted Um it's a conflicted debate. Was I doing a good thing or was I doing a wrong thing? I don't know. In the moment it was good, but perhaps in the future it was evil. But of course, perhaps me giving her the water gave her the kick that she needed and maybe she got back on her feet shortly afterwards. Who knows? We're relying this on her own free will and we don't know if it was a good or a bad thing, at least for the future. So, anyhow... Uh, be, beyond morality, we have Friedrich Nietzsche. And if you want to learn a lot about Nietzsche, I would check out the Nietzsche podcast. Um, he just goes through everything Nietzsche and is very interesting. But I would also recommend reading Beyond Good and Evil, where Nietzsche talks a lot about, basically summarizes all of his philosophies that he's ever written. But if you really want to go beyond good and evil, I'd read Thus Spoke Zarathustra.
where he kind of really formulates these ideas of going beyond good and evil. And there's also the genealogy of morals. So, but Nietzsche says that we should go beyond good and evil because good and evil aren't, they're arbitrary. Good and evil are arbitrary, they're subjective. They don't, they're basically there to control us. I mean, just like dogs. You reward them if they do good. You punish them if they do bad. Right? That's what morality is here for. Uh, we see this in our laws. And of course, today, morality is based off of what everyone else thinks is good or evil. Right? What the herd thinks. What the loudest people think is good or evil. And that's kind of how it's always been, really. But today, the communication is so prevalent. We can communicate so easily that everything has become conflicted. And people don't know what is good or evil. They're confused now because it keeps changing so quickly that it's like it's hard to keep track of. But anyhow, uh, Nietzsche wanted to do this reevaluation of all values uh, because he thought our values as a Western society were ridiculous um, and they're subjective and they're not really based on anything useful so he thought that what is good is what preserves the species what makes one stronger and what is evil is what makes us weak but this is again a formulation of good and evil a subjective formulation of good and evil because then the day good and evil aren't real they're illusions they're Illusatory. And of course, Nietzsche points this out. Uh, Nietzsche contradicts himself a lot in his writings because, I mean, smart people contradict themselves because they constantly change their ideas, right? But Nietzsche both says that he wants to reevaluate all values and he says his opinion on what's good and evil, but he also has stated various times that good and evil aren't actually real. And if you recall in my last podcast, I quoted Nietzsche again from Beyond Good and Evil, and he said that what is done out of love is always done beyond good and evil so anyhow um go beyond good and evil by loving and by giving love to the world so i'll leave it with that anyhow peace out uh the next i have a few things coming up on the podcast i've been reading this book called uh the unbearable lightness of being i'll be talking a bit about that and then after that book, I'm going to read The Wisdom of Insecurity, which uh, podcast guest Monomia Stone has suggested to me. It is a book by Alan Watts about, you guessed it, The Wisdom of Insecurity. And likewise, I just want to plug that I finished writing my novel on death and God, which is a fiction about a boy who goes to hell to slay the gods and save everything that he's ever loved. So go check that out. It's on my website at into the absurdcom You can scroll down and there's two buttons. Uh, you can click on either of them. One brings you to the Amazon ebook uh, link where you can buy the ebook that you can read on your Kindle. The other brings you to the link to buy it as a PDF or an EPUB file. So anyhow, I uh, hope you have a wonderful rest of your week weekend, day, or whatever. Take it easy.